everybody. Um, this is uh, an event um, that is very timely, uh, as you can tell from the title, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the rule of law, turning the crisis into opportunity. We have uh, the pleasure to have um, Dr. Anna Damasco with us today, uh, who served as a visiting scholar at uh, our institute, the Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies, uh, in uh, late, uh, late in the spring semester. Um, uh, of 2021. And um, she was here um, as part of uh, a fellowship with the reconstitution program that she will give us a, a little bit more information about soon. And um, uh, I'm Professor Harris Milonas, and I'm uh, a, a, a faculty at the political science department and affiliated with the Institute. Um, and um, I want to say a few words uh, um, about Dr. Damasco so that you have some context. And then I'm going to pass, uh, pass uh, the floor uh, and the, the mic, so to speak, to her so that she can actually um, present this very important topic. And then we're going to open up for uh, a Q&A session uh, towards the end. So I ask everybody to. Uh, you know, uh, keep their cameras off uh, while we're doing the presentation and then you can turn on your cameras if you want. Uh, keeping in mind that this is a live, uh, broadcasted live um, on social media. So Dr. Damasco holds um, a bachelor um, degree uh, from um, uh, a BA from the Democritus University of Thrace in law. And um, she has a master's uh, from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, as well uh, as a PhD in European Economic Criminal Law from the Queen Mary University of, Lon of London. She has uh, over 15, uh, in fact, she has an 18 years of work experience in the areas of regulatory uh, compliance and supervision of the banking and financial sectors. And she has um, uh, published extensively on issues of good governance, anti-corruption and regulation. Um, and. Um, she has also served as a researcher for Transparency International and as chair of the Greek chapter of Transparency International. So a lot of interesting uh, experiences I'm sure she has gathered from these. Uh, she's a member of the Athens Bar Association and is um, also certified as a fraud examiner, anti-money laundering specialist, general sanction specialist and data protection officer. So, um, a lot of uh, hats and a lot of um, a lot of important posts. So, uh, without um, delaying things any further, I would like to pass, um, as I said, the mic um, to Anna uh, Damascu, who is going to uh, share also a PowerPoint presentation with you and um, walk us through her um, her argument. Thank you so much, Harris. Uh, few words before I move on to my PowerPoint presentation and uh, my teaser slides, uh, because there is not so much uh, text on them. Uh, I would like to first uh, tell you that uh, during uh, the academic year 2020-2021, I have been honored with a fellowship by the well-known and extremely supportive, as I found out, reconstitution program, which comprises a joint program of Forum Transregionale Studien and Democracy Reporting International and is funded by Stiftung Mercator. The program traditionally studies the rule of law in uh, Europe. In this framework, I've had the pleasure of doing two study visits, one in the Secretariat of Transparency International for the period February, April 2021, and another one in the Institute of uh, European, Russian and Eurasian Studies of George Washington uh, University for the period May to July 2021 for which I would like to thank in particular Matthew Culley, the manager of the research programs and the professor Harris Milonas, which is, who serves in the uh, Department of Political uh, Science. So let me share my screen and my slides with you. Please confirm. I think you see them all now. Great. So yeah. this you can, you can see at the bottom of this slide the, the three entities which are supporting the fellowship. Uh, the topic which we are going to explore today together is uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as Harry said, and the rule of law and how we can turn the crisis into an opportunity. Every crisis has opportunities. 
So three main areas that uh, we're going to discuss today, what is meant really by this notion of rule of law? Uh, how has rule of law been eroded during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic worldwide? And what measures need to be taken by countries around the world for restoring their rule of law regimes? few disclaimers on my part. Uh, the observations and proposals do not refer to any specific jurisdiction. They are based on the study of incidents worldwide and on international best practices. Uh, the aim of this discussion, of this presentation today, is like more for awareness raising purposes, which can then lead us to capacity buildings in our countries. Uh, I believe like each one of us in their the post, I mean, may have some uh, implications with the rule of law. And it's all, first of all, all of us, it's good to be aware of what the challenges are and how we can uh, further uh, tackle them. So what is really the rule of law? Let's uh, explore this. I mean, you shall find, if you Google around, if you search a bit, you shall find quite few notions surrounding uh, that of the rule of law. Uh, but what is meant really? I mean, in a country governed by the rule of law, all public powers should always act within the constraints set out by the law in accordance with the values of democracy and fundamental rights and under the control of independent and impartial courts. Therefore, the rule of law includes principles such as legality, legal certainty, prohibition of uh, arbitrary exercise of executive power, effective judicial protection, effective judicial uh, review for the respect of uh, fundamental rights, separation of powers, equality before the law. While countries have different national identities, legal systems and traditions, the core meaning of the rule of law is more or less the same uh, across uh, the world. Respect for the rule of law is essential for citizens and businesses, so as to trust public institution and its uh, key principles are supported, are of support to citizens. In other words, the rule of law has a direct impact on the life of every person in numerous uh, ways. Let's stay here. Ensuring respect for the rule of law is the responsibility of each and every country and should be also for the reason that deficiencies in one country of the world directly impact other countries. Uh, therefore, upholding the rule of law at global level includes also strengthening cooperation on rule of law issues within international and regional organizations. Having said the above, it should be stressed that the rule of law nowadays is at risk even in well-established democracies. So how was the rule of law eroded by the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide? The particular circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic have brought unprecedented challenges to the rule of law uh, regimes around the world, such as restriction of freedoms. We have all felt them, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, freedom to conduct business even sometimes. Public administrations, legal and constitutional systems have faced entirely new situations. Countries took exceptional measures in order to protect public health and uh, declared some form of public emergency or granted uh, special emergency powers, which often meant the suspension of customary national checks and balances. And even if not within the core meaning of uh, rule of law, even the protection of personal data and most importantly of our sensitive personal data has come uh, under severe pressure. Personal data won't be uh, analyzed during the, pres the presentation, but uh, I think that we have all faced situations where we felt that our personal data is kind of invaded. So the obvious doctrine is that responses to the crisis uh, must respect fundamental principles uh, and uh, democratic ones. In the short term, tests uh, such as uh, the ones I will mention in a while are useful, namely what those tests could be, which specific measures in measures were included, what was the time duration of those measures, whether measures were strictly necessary and proportionate, whether parliamentary and judicial oversight was exercised over those measures, whether media and civil society uh, scrutiny was available, 
And how have those powers been scaled down or scaled up uh, depending on the development of the health crisis? However, in the medium and in the long term, countries should pursue structural reform so as to be in position to maintain uh, the rule of law under serious crises, all serious crises, be it health, financial, or climate, even once. So uh, the World Justice Program has very well phrased, and then I couldn't have, have phrased it better, it's a twin crisis of public health and the rule of law. And uh, we saw, in fact, like an erosion of uh, democracy. But uh, what are the specific measures that we need to take for restoring uh, our rule of law in all our countries? First of all, maintaining the rule of law under all circumstances emanates from the universal values and principles embedded in inter alia the well-known UN Charter and international law. However, there is also a pragmatic basis for maintaining the rule of law under all circumstances, and that is the sustainable and resilient recovery. Rule of law is a means to this aim, as evidenced also by the 2030 UN Agenda on Sustainable Development Goals. You will see Goal 16 is on peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, in the last decade, a number of instruments have been developed worldwide as international best practices to promote a robust political and legal culture, supporting the rule of law and preventing uh, problems from emerging or even deepening. The points that I will uh, briefly mention in a while uh, could constitute sources of reflection for countries uh, uh, so as to examine how challenges can be addressed and learn from each other's experiences in full respect, of course, for national traditions and national particularities. There is no one size fits all. I shall briefly address those points and then I shall remain at your disposal to elaborate on any of them if needed. So let me start with justice. I mean, as I mentioned already, access to an independent judicial review with quality and efficiency is a fundamental element uh, of the rule of law. What do we mean in particular? I mean, we should strengthen structural safeguards for judicial independence on an ongoing basis. This reduces the influence of the executive uh, or the legislative power over the judiciary. Related to that is the independence of the prosecution authority from undue political pressure, especially regarding specific cases of interest to the executive or to the legislative, uh, because in this way, prosecution authorities will be better positioned to fight crime and corruption more effectively. In some countries around the world, the digitalization of the justice system may be a reality since long ago. However, this is not the situation in quite a few countries around the world. Uh, the COVID pandemic has given an extra impetus to those efforts, showing the importance of accelerating the uh, reforms to digitalize the handling of cases by uh, justice, uh, digitalize the exchange of information and documents with parties and lawyers, and the continued and easy access to justice for all. More broadly, seen, investing in justice is more than necessary for addressing efficiency challenges. I mean, we cannot have effective justice systems without adequate human and financial resources. And let me turn to a related field, that of uh, anti-corruption. I mean, justice is related to anti-corruption, but anti-corruption is more. Uh, the fight against corruption is essential for maintaining the rule of law. Corruption undermines the functioning of the state in addition to fostering organized crime. Effective anti-corruption frameworks, transparency and integrity in this exercise of state power can strengthen the rule of law. We need a comprehensive approach to fighting corruption, which must rely on a combination of prevention and repressive uh, measures. This means, in few words, uh, sufficient and impartial investigations and prosecutions and effective and proportionate and dissuasive sanctions, as well as effective recovery of uh, the proceeds of uh, corruption. It also means uh, adequate standards to protect whistleblowers against all forms of retaliation, 
setting up beneficial ownership registries of companies, enabling the exchange of financial information, and so on and so on. I mentioned before about uh, strengthening the capacity of the criminal, of the justice system in general, and we need to strengthen the capacity of the criminal justice system in particular so as to fight the corruption. Uh, because it's uh, fundamental for the judiciary, the prosecution and the law enforcement bodies to be equipped with adequate funding, human resources, technical capacity and specialized expertise, which is not given always. And then we need to also, so as to achieve some results, strike the balance between privileges and immunities of public officials and ensure that they do not constitute obstacles to the effective uh, investigation and prosecution of uh, the corrupt ones. And uh, in that respect, uh, prevention, I mean, it's not only about suppression, prevention, as I said before, is also key to success. Uh, it should cover areas such as ethical rules, awareness raising measures, rules on asset disclosures, incompatibilities and conflicts of interest, internal control mechanisms, rules on lobbying and revolving doors, access to public information. And the very fine point that we should always bear in mind is that uh, prevention measures uh, need also to be visible, to have visible results. I mean, uh, most times we talk about the visible visibility of the results of the suppression measures. I mean, how many successes we've had, but also prevention measures need to be uh, visibly recorded. Uh, so as to be convincing for the public and thus effective. Another very core uh, area of uh, interest is like uh, media. We need media pluralism and media freedom so as to ensure rule of law, especially when emergency powers lower the institutional checks on the decision makers, as was the crisis uh, uh, era the scrutiny of uh, public decisions by inter alia, the media becomes all the more important so as to maintain uh, accountability. At the same time, of course, disinformation by the media, which happens often, undermines the rule of law. Uh, diversity in the media sector is required, of course, but uh, we all know that the situation is particularly difficult for smaller media outlets which try to uh, stay independent which takes me to the independence also of the media authorities. Uh, we cannot have freedom, we cannot have pluralism unless those key actors, the independence, uh, the media authorities are independent, uh, so as to enforce pluralism. And uh, this can only be done with effective regulation, which shall keep political interference as much as possible out of uh, the media sector. Related to that is uh, the transparency of uh, the media ownership. So on one hand to conduct informed regulatory such as competition processes, but also in order to enable the public to evaluate the information and opinions that are disseminated by the media outlets. Fair and transparent distribution of state advertising, uh, which State advertising can be an important source of support to media, especially for the not-profit ones, but it can also be a source of political interference. So there should be a clear and effective rules on how uh, state advertising is uh, distributed among the media outlets. And worldwide, we often uh, see quite a lot of deaths of uh, media journalists, uh, of uh, investigative uh, journalists uh, in particular. I mean, there is even an index uh, like measuring how uh, liberal, how democratic a state is. And one of the parameters of uh, that index taking, taken into consideration is how many deaths of journalists took place in the preceding years. So we need strong measures to support and protect journalists against threats, attacks, harassment, and smear campaigns. And let me go to the last part, that of uh, the more generic, uh, let's say, checks and balances. What do we mean by that? Uh, this is, in essence, the interplay 
the cooperation and the scrutiny among different public authorities. Institutional checks and balances are, however, the core of the rule of law. Uh, while every country chooses another model, I mean, for its checks and balances, what is crucial is that it ensures the respect for the rule of law and democratic norms. As I said, there is no one size fits all, but the aim should always be the same. We need open discussions on the rule of law topic so as to strengthen the relevant culture, but we also need the constitutional reforms to strengthen our checks and balances. We need to improve the inclusiveness and the quality of uh, the legislative process uh, as the excessive use of uh, accelerated and emergency legislation can give rise to concerns over the rule of law. And during the pandemic, we've seen fast track legislative processes and absence of consultation on an extensive basis. I mean, bypassing parliament in the legislative procedure, it's also an element which uh, undermines the separation of powers, which is in itself a key principle principle of the rule of law. We also need the ex post scrutiny of such measures, including those taken to respond to the COVID-19 ex post scrutiny by parliaments, by constitutional and Supreme Courts, even by ordinary courts, by the ombudspersons and by the national human rights uh, institutions. Last but not least, civil society organizations, which in many countries operate in an unstable and unprotected environment, continue to be nevertheless a strong actor in defending the rule of law. And let me conclude by saying that, uh, as I said also in the beginning, uh, this presentation aimed at facilitating a common understanding of uh, what the rule of law is. The challenges uh, it is currently facing worldwide, with no country being an exception, even well-established democracies face challenges and the tools that are available to us for rebuilding robust rule of law regimes and cultures. We can make them even better than what they were before the pandemic. And be there, being better equipped will help us all to take up the challenges of the current unprecedented through crisis in full respect for our democratic principles and values. So thank you so much and time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a very, um, um, very impressive um, presentation in the sense that you also covered so much um, in terms of um, uh, giving us a, a good understanding, I think, of how far reaching a lot of the um, changes in our lives have been in that field. Uh, most of us probably think of more immediate things, right? Our personal uh, ways that we interact with the with the measures and the pandemic, but maybe we sometimes forget the more general um, consequences uh, at the systemic level that you very much uh, um, focused on and articulated. So uh, I would like to turn this um, to a more interactive maybe discussion, maybe. Um, Someone from our audience wants to turn on their camera and ask a question, or I can call on people. Uh, um, I don't know if um, somebody has a question first or if I should follow up. Um, we also are, um, I should say, live streaming from uh, Facebook and um, probably from YouTube as well. So if you want to, um, if you're watching us from there, you can also post a question there and I can, uh, I can ask it uh, while we're um, online. So I'll give some space so that people can actually think about it. Um, let me see here if we have any question on the Facebook page. Um, there we go. Uh, and Matt can also paste them if um, if there are questions there. Um, okay, so since I'm not seeing any hands here, 
um, I'm going to ask the first question. So, so I was wondering, um, what's your, what's the um, the uh, the legal approach at least? What does it say when it comes to um, um, kids uh, who are um, below 18, right? And um, how do you see the pandemic affecting the rights of um, kids um, who are affected, but they're not, um, um, you know, I guess they're all under their guardians, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of pressures, right? Right now, especially um, on, on children, both in terms of schooling, but also in terms of vaccination, especially for those above 12, and how, how does this play out? So um, I'm thinking of a case where some, I don't know, 15 year old may not want to be vaccinated, but their guardian wants them to be vaccinated. How, how, how does your framework account for these type of situations? Now you take us to another perspective, uh, that of like human rights. Human rights is of course very related to the rule of law. Uh, also, I mean, I think we're gonna see, and we've seen already by national and uh, other jurisdictions, uh, quite a few cases on that. I mean, uh, even with adults, like uh, adults not being in position to decide themselves and their uh, representatives, their legal representatives uh, acting on their behalf. With children, it's even more uh, evident. Uh, you can see that quite a lot of uh, children's rights are under severe pressure, like as you said, from the right to schooling uh, to the right of uh, vaccination. I would say also, uh, the right to uh, psychological stability of children. I mean, uh, school is not just about uh, learning things, it's about socializing and acquiring social skills, having kids deprived of such relations because you have like uh, closed them down uh, at home for several months. It's also the right uh, violation of their right to uh, psychological uh, stability. So, I mean, on one hand, we're going to see, uh, let's say, certain uh, behavior, certain patterns of behavior in the medium term and how they have evolved. I mean, babies nowadays do not hug, uh, are taught not to hug, not to kiss, not, you know, to be in a social distance, which was is very weird for all of us. But this is their reality and they grow up, you know, with a distance. This all affects human behavior and human rights and everything, but I think that uh, uh, we're going to see from a legal perspective, quite a lot of uh, cases being challenged before the courts. Uh, but what is at stake here is also th that uh, we do take, uh, as I said, that you know they're not within the core sphere of what we mean uh, rule of law, but in my eyes, the personal data, human rights are uh, quite, are, very very strongly challenged during this era of uh, the pandemic and we should really take them into consideration also try uh anna i'm not sure if i'm the only one who has a problem hearing try to you. protect and boost them further there might be a, a little bit of a... I'm be... back. Did you lose me for a second? I did, I think. I, I okay. Think we lost you just for a little bit. So, so yeah, no, I mean, you're raising some really uh, thorny issues. Um, and it seems that uh, governments are slowly trying to uh, um, uh, address some of these lacunas. Uh, but I was wondering, given your experience and your networks, have you seen... Uh, a global movement or some type of um, regional, maybe even movement to um, collaborate on the, uh, along those lines and kind of harmonize the approach. Uh, are countries coming together and legal experts coming together, I guess, globally to try to um, address some of these? 
Uh, do we I see mean, the challenges? I guess that the challenges of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic are present in all academic and scientific fora nowadays, in all political uh, cooperation structures and everything ranging from uh, the UN to the European Union and to, I don't know, like the Pan-American uh, institutions and everything. And in different, uh, you know, in different versions. I mean, it's not only about democracy, it's not only about human rights. Uh, every scientific field every field of human life has been affected i think by such uh, uh, by this uh, dimension and it has become you know kind of boring perhaps for some but it's still of interest i think to examine because you know in every aspect in every conference you will see you know blah 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 and the covid-19 pandemic blah 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 and the covid-19 pandemic we're a bit uh, let's say tired of uh, seeing this but still i feel there is value in uh, adding this dimension in uh, the usual things, the traditional things we used to study up uh, to now. I mean, it has impacted life perhaps more than any other crisis. I mean, of course, the financial, the global financial and economic crisis impacted human rights, but uh, it's uh, perhaps this uh, pandemic crisis is like affecting more uh, fields, it's affecting the economy, it's affecting uh, nearly all fields of uh, human life. And there are <clears throat> those who, who, in all the things you've discussed, uh, more directly, you implied it, but more directly, uh, regime type uh, issues. So um, there have been those in various institutions and um, think tanks that have suggested that the COVID-19 pandemic has been <clears throat> used as an opportunity by um, authoritarian leaders or democratically elected leaders who are who have more uh, authoritarian uh, in order to um, um, justify measures that are not actually uh, just to prevent the pandemic from spreading. Uh, how do how do you see what's the balance you're keeping in that? Because there is. That's a more political discussion, obviously. It has less to do with the legal ramifications um, um, per se, but they are interconnected in this case, right? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. I think I heard the whole question. Uh, so I think, I mean, the pandemic was a good pretext, was a good excuse for those that wanted to do the extra mile in the sense of like taking measures that uh, in other situations they would need to explain uh, very clearly. And in that situation, perhaps they did not explain it to uh, the extent needed or they did not feel that uh, they were accountable to anybody. And all, not all those measures were for the benefit of uh, the citizens, or they might be, you know, in the for the benefit of uh, the citizens uh, in the short term. But in the long term, they change our culture. Let's say, uh, to, and to give an example uh, again from the let's say something which is closer to all of us, and we perhaps uh, feel it uh, easier, like uh, the protection of our personal data, and the, in more particular of our uh, sensitive personal data of like health data and everything uh, it was a good pretext for all employers for state authorities you know to gather all such uh, data have you uh, been affected by covid have you been uh, vaccinated and taking your temperatures when you enter the office you know on a daily basis and writing them down asking you about your family and everything and uh, in some cases quite a lot of those uh, actors uh, went beyond the limits but it was impressive and i will give you the example of uh, the uh, the data protection authority in italy and we all know that italy uh, suffered uh, lots of like uh, 
hundreds of thousands of deaths, even like in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of uh, this very difficult situation that Italy was facing. I remember I had read, let's say, the ruling, the decision of uh, the Data Protection Authority of Italy, which set very, very clear boundaries to what an employer, what a state authority can do uh, with regard to the processing of health uh, data uh, of people. So uh, we should not lose hope. I mean, there are always beacons of legality. There are beacons of uh, protection of the rule of law. And uh, it's just, you know, that we need to be aware and we need to build those institutions strong in uh, during like peace times because uh, so as to be resilient during uh, the crisis uh, times. Uh, it's for me, it's all a matter like crisis first comes as a value crisis and then as a health economic uh, or climate crisis or whatever mm -hmm. yeah so uh i would like to turn it to uh thodoros bizakis from the greek embassy the deputy chief of mission the floor is yours let me uh unmute you hello can you hear me yes, yes. okay can, hello hello if you want uh Thodori. okay yeah sure sure Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these interesting um, uh, positions we just heard. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm from the Embassy of Greece, but definitely I, I have we have also a personal interest in this discussion. Live Greek, as you know, you know Greeks living here in the United States. Uh, the whole world has been affected uh, by the pandemic, and it's it's true that the dimension of the pandemic, uh, I would say, turned upside down many things in our lives and also in our you know legal and constitutional uh, situations now um uh, we 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 all agree that the rule of law is definitely uh one of the most important shared values that we have you know in united states in european countries and everybody uh, and all the the most uh, the democracies um uh, in the modern world but um we, I mean, I would like to 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 see I mean, what's your view. How, to what extent, the rule of law now uh, in this pandemic era is 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 being called to decide or to take a position, you know, um, between uh, liberties and human rights, fundamental liberties, on the one hand, on the other hand, securing global health in every state or even in bigger. Uh, um, areas like the European Union or the United States. And uh, if we you know to what extent this maybe, you know, could create a precedent, uh, a, a dangerous or not precedent in the future, taking into account that, of course, we all hope that the pandemic in one or two years with the vaccines and everything will, 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 will um, disappear like a big threat for the humanity. So what will be left uh, from the pandemic on this, uh, you know, specific um, area um, uh, regarding what rule of law needs to decide as I see it from, from this, at this time right now. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Let me remind you, I mean, I, I like making this comparison. When the global uh, economic and financial crisis hit us, some years ago, we all said, oh, it's time for regulation. We were very unregulated. I mean, it's time for regulation. And after that, all global standards worldwide changed with regard to regulation. There was so excessive regulation that, you know, uh, like businesses said, we cannot uh, bear the burden of so much. It costs very, very much. The pandemic, uh, on the other hand, was seen as an opportunity for deregulation. And what I mean, not deregulation in the sense that we didn't have extra measures, we did have extra measures, but we also had the bypass of uh, quite of uh, a, a lot of standard legislative procedures. As I said, very fast track procedures, bypassing the parliament, which would come ex post and everything. Uh, but in my, of course, you need such. Uh, let's say, mechanism so as to tackle imminent risks. Uh, however, I do not agree with uh, this path, you know, that uh, this has certain limits. This has certain limits and uh, you still need to have checks and balances even for those uh, 
unregular uh, modes of uh, like imposing measures and everything. So also in my eyes, like in my understanding, in my legal culture, uh, tackling the current pandemic is not uh, a fight that does not go hand in hand with regulation and with democratic uh, approaches and everything. As I said, you know, in Italy, we suffered like uh, thousands of deaths at that time. The Data Protection Authority said, no, no, you cannot keep and process all kinds of personal data of persons. I mean, they would have every ground, every legal reason to say, oh, no, we process everything because we need to tackle this situation and we need to get back to normal. But still, there were like boundaries and i feel that uh, we should this is the time when we should all be aware that's why i said that this is an awareness raising discussion and the capacity building discussion because you know the easy path to backslide is to say ah forget about the usual processes forget about uh, uh, the usual uh, legislation and safeguards now we need extra uh, powers now we need the more flexible processes uh, yes, to a certain extent, but with very, uh, very like uh, strict limits, I would say. Is, um, do you, would you like to follow up, uh, Tadori? Or okay, so I was going to. Uh, do you see a pattern or some patterns emerging? Are there countries that are more? Um, trigger happy, let's say, on legislation or like much faster to adopt and then others follow? Um, and if yes, are the, what are these countries? Are they, um, is there a pattern in terms of regime type? Is there a pattern in terms of um, being wealthy or not, developed or developing? Is, are there such patterns that you uh, have seen from your legal perspective? I mean, I would not be in a position, let's say, to name and shame countries. And uh, I was, uh, I even witnessed discussions, for example, like, uh, oh, look how well uh, they responded to the virus in uh, China, uh, where they imposed, you know, very strict measures on citizens uh, uh, very fastly and everything. And here, for example, in the Western world, where we're all liberal, we take uh, into consideration human rights and democratic values uh, very seriously. And therefore, we are not as effective in uh, fighting uh, COVID. I mean, I remind you that, you know, in uh, China, they even had drones, let's say, to uh, supervise the circulation of citizens and whether they respect curfews and start, stuff like that. And there was a discussion also in the Western world whether we need to adopt such uh, processes. I mean, because drones were uh, thought were considered very invasive, uh, let's say, uh, practices and everything. Uh, you could say, th so on one hand, you could say that the authoritarian regimes, which were not accountable to anybody, they were more effective. I mean, one could support this view. And then uh, states with uh, more democratic systems, they had to go through a lot of processes. And for these reasons, they were not effective. Uh, I don't want to take this approach. As I said, that uh, you need to convince citizens through democratic processes on uh, how to respond to the crisis on how to safeguard their health, on how to safeguard their interests. And uh, whereas we may be, you know, uh, closed in our homes still in some cases, and perhaps the coming winter will uh, uh, see us even more closed and the story will uh, repeat itself again. Uh, but still, we need to uh, bear in mind that uh, it's for our own benefit to respect democratic values at all times, because this is going to be like a boomerang. I mean, you violate it once, you create a precedent, and then you cannot go back. So better, slower, and more effective than faster and, you know, destroying what you have built in the previous years. I see. So, um, and. It, it, towards the, the closing, if there is no other question from the audience, I wanted to ask, if you were to advise a government, um, what would be the 
the three you know takeaway lessons if we were to summarize them in a more uh, you know elevator pitch what would you advise a uh, president or a uh, prime minister of of uh, a country uh, to do with respect to rule of law and covid-19 uh, i mean my piece of advice would be more general not just with regard to covid i mean my approach would build like build strong institutions for all times. Uh, it has political costs, we all know that. Uh, there is resistance from several uh, stakeholders when you're trying to build an institution. Uh, so it's not like uh, perhaps not very beneficial for politicians in the short term or even the medium term, but uh, this is the only way like building effective and strong institutions to survive, be resilient and uh, be productive. I mean, there is no other way. Uh, for my, for me, all kind of development, all kind of uh, uh, well-being of citizens goes through strong institutions. So, and it's not done overnight. I mean, Rome was not built uh, in a day. You need time. You need to change perceptions and uh, you need to perhaps make reforms gradually over a quite extended period of time so mm -hmm. don't give up i see um thank you so much um if we don't have any more questions from the audience i think your your, your topic is so difficult for some people to um um come up with questions because we're living in it first of all i would say second you're an expert so you did do a great job, you know, giving us the lay of the land. So you covered uh, most of the questions, I think, with your presentation. And um, my my questions were primarily trying to provoke you to get kind of off path, but you st you stayed <laughs> you stayed quite close to your uh, message, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, you know, and the political scientist always tries to find variation and why there is variation in something. But from, um, from an institution building point of view, I, I assume you want less variation. You want more countries doing similar things so that they're prepared right, um, to weather such storms, speaking metaphorically. Uh, and uh, it sounds from your presentation that you don't believe this is um, the last um, state of emergency, let's say, that we will go through. Uh, you seem to uh, have a, uh, your presentation at least gave me the feeling that you think we need to act now because more may be coming, not just in the in the shape of a pandemic, but other type of challenges, right? Sure. This is humanity. I mean, on a yeah. on a smaller or greater level, we're always going to be uh, challenged by catastrophes. Yeah, and and that makes me think of uh, you know issues with climate change that have been discussed quite uh, extensively. Um, and recently uh, in Greece, um, we had, you know, uh, catastrophic, catastrophic fires and it, it's going on in other parts of the world. Um, I, I think there are um, issues re that relate to the rule of law in all of those um, type of crises that are both global, but they also have a regional kind of um, um, uh, manifestation, let's say, right? So... Well, thank you so much. Uh, if there is no thank other, thank you very much. If there is no other question from the audience, uh, we can uh, end uh, five minutes earlier um, and give time for people to think about what we discussed. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Bye bye.